<laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge we have a new board member at Wellington Free who hasn't had a board meeting yet, but Kerry Prendergast, I understand, has agreed to be on the board. And I see in the audience at least two, probably several more ex-board members, and I should acknowledge them as well, uh, because I'm the chief executive and I've been on the boards and I know that I have to keep friendly with the board. <laughs> I thought what I would do first is give you five minutes on how I got to be standing here as the Chief Executive of Wellington Free in my rather odd career and then come and talk to you about the current situation. So it's nice to see many people I've worked with over the years. I began my working life as a probation officer in Christchurch a long time ago. I was going to say before most of you were born, but that's not true actually when I look around. <laughs> Because <laughs> often I have to say that nowadays, but not, not here. So um, I, uh, times have changed a lot because my first, um, it was when miniskirts were in the last time. So that gives you an idea of how long ago it was. And I was 22 years old and I was in the court where there were no, very, very few women lawyers, very few women police, uh, so very few women in the court in fact. And the judge called me Mr. Probation Officer. Uh, times have changed, haven't they? It was amazing. I mean, I think he knew the difference, but uh, he still called me Mr. Probation Officer. I, I left the probation service because I hit the glass ceiling. Uh, they were very interested in having what I considered underwhelming men to run the probation service rather than any kind of woman. So um, I moved on to different parts of the public service and went through uh, the reforms of the 80s and 90s in different government roles and was very lucky to, um, to get uh, qualified as a social worker first in Swansea and then uh, management training in Chicago and Stanford and Melbourne as well as um, attending New Zealand universities. Um, one of the roles I had was Equal Employment Opportunities uh, Leader in the late uh, 80s, and it's where I learnt that sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. And I'm sure most of you, many of you have been in that situation before. I then went to, uh, I was asked if I would join the setup team with Contact Energy. And I spent six months in Wellington extracting the um, uh, resources and people out of the old ECNZ into the new, the new SOE, which didn't have a name initially, but became Contact Energy. And while it was still an SOE, I ended up at Clyde and Roxburgh, running the hydro dams at Clyde and Roxburgh, which was really a, a, an amazing change in my career. I thought I'd just tell you one funny story about that. Um, well, one of the things that happened on my second day there, um, how many of you have been to Clyde? Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about when I say that there's the dam and then there's the office right, the, right in front of the dam and then there's a trickle of a river that goes away down through the, the traditional um, uh, Otago, central Otago uh, landscape. To get to the dam, you cross over a little bridge further down and drive straight up towards, you'll remember, if you visited the dam. And... Uh, <coughs> I remember my second day, and I am talking about the mid-90s, and when those flicker things were only available for garages, we didn't have many of them around. Now they're everywhere, of course. They open everything. But in those days, they didn't. Um, they gave me one in my car to get to the, to the dam. And I remember driving up towards the dam, wondering how this job was going to go. And I pressed the flicker, and these big gates went like this. And I drove through... And then I got to the next gate and I pressed the flicker and the next ones went up like this. And I drove through and I was getting close to the dam and I remember saying to myself, I'm running this thing. <laughs> <laughs> of course I had all the same issues when I got inside and whatever, but it was interesting. The general manager, the um, operations manager at the time tells me now, or he told me later after I'd finished, that I called him into his off to my office uh, the third day I was there and said, Murray, you and I'll get on a lot better if you stop using words that I don't understand. <laughs> and he said he had to come back two days later with the management team and they sat there and they said, Diana, we can't do our job without using the word megawatt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's not true, but that's what he told me. <laughs> I was with AMP after that. I worked at AMP. I thought it would be a useful experience for me to try working in the private sector, having been in the public sector. And having been involved with the NGO sector around the edges, and some of you 
will know, and I know some of you because of this, uh, I was involved with the J.R. McKenzie Trust and the McKenzie Family Trust and was a friend of Sir Roy's. So <coughs> I decided to go to the private sector. I talked to myself about whether I should go back to university and retrain and do a diff take a different tack. And then I decided that this opportunity came up at AMP that maybe I would uh, have my university time in, a pri in the private sector, and I spent uh, four years with AMP. Uh, and the last year of that was in London, where I watched a company um, overuse the lazy money that they found. And some of you will recall what happened to the companies in Britain with AMP when the management team got a bit zealous about overusing the, uh, the lazy money that they thought they'd found. I came home here and worked on a not-for-profit project called Funds, looking at how New Zealanders might save for their children's tertiary education, which evolved in a certain, in a sort of a way into Farawa, which is the saving scheme that Naitahu have, and also into KiwiSaver. And about that time, I was asked if I'd take the role of retirement commissioner. I thought anybody that took a role with a name like that must be mad. I thought it would be exceedingly boring, and of course it was anything but, and I had ten amazing years. It was a job that's called, that was about influence without power. It had two roles. One was financial literacy for the nation, and we did that using the sorted website, which of course is the best free independent financial website in the world. And Julia Gillard, remember her? <laughs> she uh, put into her manifesto when she became the, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia that she wanted a website like sorted.org.nz, and we thought, yes. Um, the other side of it, uh, Liz has already said, talked a little bit about the long-term strategy, is the nation ready? Are we ready was the other side of that job. So I just thought you'd uh, romp through my career, which has been all over the place. So I thought I'd be at the beach about now. Um, I thought after 10 years in the Retirement Commission, a tiring kind of role because you're constantly having to put yourself up there to, to get the issues in front of everybody. I thought that I would stay at the beach, but this job came up and I was approached and uh, here I am. So I'm really pleased to be uh, the Chief Executive of Wellington Free. Um, there's lots to talk about. I thought what I would do is just show you the way things have changed over the years. 1927 is when <coughs> Charles Norwood was driving through Kelvin in his mayoral car. I think in those days, uh, Kerry, they probably had um, chauffeurs, and I think he was being chauffeur-driven to his job. And he saw somebody who was lying on the ground who had been, I don't know, knocked over maybe, but there was a ga crowd gathered, and he called out, why haven't you called an ambulance? And they said something like, the, the ambulance is busy and it belonged to the Harbour Board. So um, he went to work and thought, this is mad, Wellington, Wellington people deserve uh, a free ambulance and started the uh, free ambulance service with support from the, the um, uh, fathers of the city, it would have been in those days, the Odlins, as you know, uh, gave the land for the for free ambulance. Uh, while it's now called the St John Bar, it was always the Wellington Free Building. <laughs> I, I wish the people in the bar had called it the Wellington Free Bar, and then, of course, I don't wish that. So, <laughs> so it's a bit tricky. Um, so, But in the early days, of course, the people that uh, picked you up were bearers or stretcher bearers, and they threw you in the back of an old Kingswood, well, a new Kingswood station wagon, and raced you off to the to the hospital as quickly as possible, and the whole idea in the early days was that it was a um, a, a transport system really. A, 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 there was little first aid. It was very military. It was very male. It was a, it was very much get you to the to the hospital as soon as possible. Um, and of course, in the early days, they couldn't stand up in the back of the ambulance, so they couldn't do much. To, they had to treat you on this and put the stretcher in the back and then drive as fast as they could. So basically, a, a good driver, a good um, driver who um, uh, was happy to work in that very military way was uh, what we were looking for. Um, it moved, of course, in the 60s, and, and most of us in this room grew up with it being uh, the ambulance being the, the fast, speedy bells, uh, take you to hospital as quickly as possible. And that's what uh, continued through the latter part of last century. However, there's now been a huge change, and there's, we now have highly qualified paramedics. They do uh, their first degree uh, in paramedicine at either AUT or Fitirea. Most of ours are at Fitirea. Um, and they also then do further qualifications, so there's levels of qualification. 
um, to, uh, to do a better job and to do a more specialised job. Um, so the, 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 the system has changed. The other thing you may be interested in is that only 10% of the uh, people we deal with are emergencies now. Only 10%. It's a real surprise to me. What happens is that, that we have several different kinds of treatment and the first one is by phone. We have people ringing up with things that you don't need to go to hospital for and you don't need an ambulance because it's expensive. But what you do need is to talk to somebody. Uh, uh, and in the past, when we were young, um, the doctor would come to your home. And the doctors don't come to your home now, so you ring 111 and um, talk through with a, help li a health line. The second tranche is that we might come to your home as a, as a uh, paramedic's uh, and, and bring the ambulance, but we might decide that it's better to leave you at home. And it might be that uh, you don't need any more care than we can give you. And of course nowadays they can give you quite a lot of treatment on the site. And for lots of people that's a far better thing than going a long way from say Kapiti or, or um, other parts of our uh, area to hospital. And the third one is that we take you to hospital with the lights and bells and that's called a purple and a red and that means we're in a hurry and I tell you what, if you ever sit in an ambulance with the bells on, you realise what a lot of idiots we've got on the motorway. I couldn't believe it the other day, we were going to a cardiac arrest and there's people just don't get out of the way. I couldn't believe it. I was, I, I was, these guys are used to it. I was just amazed with every bell, every footer, everything we could think of to get these people out of the road. And they just, I think they probably had um, sound in their ears and didn't uh, know it was happening, so it was really surprising. Anyway, so um, there has been a huge change, and I just wanted to talk about that. We also um, uh, are looking at how we do our business and what we do. We want to be, and we believe we are a world-class paramedic service for the Greater Wellington and Wairarapa. And some of you may know we took over the Wairarapa Ambulance Service uh, two years ago. Um, and, uh, Wairarapa and Taranaki were the last two ones owned by the hospital service, local hospital. And we took those over and uh, now run that service. Um, so, we, well, we didn't take Taranaki, that went to St John. The rest of New Zealand is covered by St John. Some people get this muddle. St John have the ambulance now for the rest of New Zealand and Wellington Free has the greater Wellington area, Pekka Pekka Road south, across to Mount Bruce and south. So it, that, that they're quite different organisations and we're the only free one. St John you get, a, and some of you, we've been talking at the table, some of you uh, have, who've used a St John ambulance, you get a bill uh, and that's how it's done. In Wellington, uh, we have decided that what we'll do is uh, uh, have a free service. So that does mean that we have to find ways of um, paying for that service. And um, what we're also trying to do, of course, is um, have a uh, strategic plan that helps the staff and the community understand where Wellington Free sits. So that's, those are the kinds of things we want to be. We want to be, of course, a great place to work. We want to be understood to be a part of Wellington, of New Zealand's health service, as well as um, providing uh, leading edge care in the Wellington region. Um, we do that by doing a whole lot of things. So people think of just the emergency ambulance. We, of course, have a part ownership in Freedom Alarms, and some of you will know Bupa and St John, but Freedom Alarms are uh, the Wellington Free Alarms uh, system for people who need an alarm around their neck or on their wrist. We also have uh, the emergency, um, sorry, the urgent community care. I talked about the phone line. We have a special project uh, uh, up at Kapiti where we're, we're working with the government to see whether we can offer um, free hospital care to a community in a much more efficient and cheaper way. And the project is being evaluated next year. Uh, so we've been working up there. We have the paramedic that goes down the line on the helicopter into the sea or onto the cliff is actually a Wellington Free staff member, a Wellington Free paramedic. While Life Flight is a separate organisation and needs support and everything, the paramedics that work there, the people that do the care, are members of uh, staff members of Wellington Free because of course it would be very hard for a, for a helicopter to keep paramedics up to that skill so we have highly qualified and they rotate round the, through the road as well so that they can keep up their skills. 
Um, patient transfer is something that the government pays us to do, taking people from Kimi Peru to Wellington or from rest homes to the hospital or from other places. So we do that. And they look like ambulances, but they'll have patient transfer written on the side. And some of you will have used that or know families that have. We have the rescue, the, pe the guy that fell off the cliff the other day at uh, Boom Rock. Uh, that was, there were two of our paramedics climbed down the cliff to, to look after them. And also they go into the bush. They, I, uh, you know, uh, four hours walking at night with a stretcher to bring somebody who's broken their leg out and that kind of work. So it's pretty amazing. We do research and we have events. One of the things that I need your help with is if you know anyone that runs an event in Wellington, Wellington Free will, uh, would love to run that event for you. We charge, of course, for that because that we charge the organisation that's running the event, not the end user. But, of course, but a lot of people go to St John, but in the Wellington region we think you should use us and uh, that would be useful for us. So you can see that this, the service is not just the emergency ambulance that people thought about. I just want to tell you two things before I finish. I'm happy to take questions if we have time, but one of the things is my first day at the, at the 111 call centre. And we, you know, we go about our daily lives and don't think of the call centre. Um, and, uh, but it's there all the time. It's in the headquarters in Thorndon, as you know, where the Wellington Free Headquarters are. And I went along there to um, meet the staff a few times, and then I thought I'd better make some time to sit. And I, you know, I could tell you about my days on the ambulance, but this day was amazing to me. A young woman um, who'd been working for a... Um, uh, a year in, on the phones, I sat with her. So I put the phones on after saying hello to everybody. I put the phones on, and at first, the first reaction I had was that this must be a training session because the first call was a hanging. And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe my ears. And I turned to her and saw her just going through her process so incredibly well. A, a jogger had seen in some, a, a hanging in a, in a park in Wellington. He got the completely wrong direction of where he was. Um, she worked him through to, to make sure that she could find out where he was. And then she had to make sure that somebody in the room called the police. She then had to get the jogger to run back to get the ambulance to come in, and she kept talking to him on the phone while she did that. Um, so that was pretty incredible. I thought, wow, this is pretty amazing. My first... I've only been here a week. and this is... The second one was a little boy who had poured boiling water all over himself, uh, his face and neck. And um, she was amazing again, as was the mother on this occasion. She said afterwards that the mother was more amazing than sometimes they just can't talk. So she said, where are you? And, of course, the person, she didn't, they were on holiday. She didn't know the address. She, she was at a, um, a motor camp, holiday park thing. Anyway, um, the, the call taker has all these things to help. She said, is there a brochure in the room? And the mother hadn't thought of that and went and got the brochure and had the street address so we could get the ambulance to the right spot. Uh, the third one was somebody, an old man who'd fallen over and had pressed his buzzer. And she was talking with him, but he couldn't hear her. So she was saying, it's OK, Bill, the ambulance is two minutes away. And she can see the ambulance. By the way, the call taker doesn't dispatch the ambulance because they are too busy. So the, the system sends it to someone sitting over there and they are finding the closest ambulance. And, the, and she, he kept saying, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. And she turned to me and said, at least he's alive. And I thought, well, that's true. And the ambulance got there and we could see later what, ha what happened. And the last one was a woman who banged her head on the, her locker at work at 11 o'clock and it was now 2.30 and she felt, a little, she felt a bit dizzy. So this is one of the calls where she said, we're not going to send an ambulance, what we're going to do is put you through to the health line and you can talk to a, to a medical person who can help you decide what's best to do. If you need an ambulance, the health person will come back to us and we'll send somebody. And I thought that was, she managed that very well. So I had been there for 20 minutes or less and I had those call, she had those calls and I was just amazed, and I thought you might like to hear about those. The other thing I need to do is I need to find five million a year. If you want to pass those out, I'll start talking. So we've locked the doors, and your, your little pathetic little bits of money you're putting in the tin is not enough. <laughs> so what I've decided to do is I've discovered that Rotary Clubs are fantastic, and you know you are. You've been giving us the money for the um, defibrillators, and they've been 
they're being placed around Wellington as we speak. We have a great relationship with you and thank you very much for all the money you raise. The second thing we do is that we know that Rotary, Lions, Zonta and other groups are very good at raising money. We know that people give in their um, bequests. We know that people give in the um, uh, street appeal and that's in September so we're looking forward to you giving. One thing I discovered however is that business in Wellington doesn't give anything to Wellington Free because there's no process for business to do so. So I have gone around all several of the chief executives of the large organisations and of course I discover a problem. If you're a large company, you want to have sponsorship of something nationwide. You want to give something across, you know, in Gore and Kaitar and Hastings, as well as Wellington. So what we've decided to do is, um, I've decided to do is try and persuade them to give in kind and we've been very lucky that we're getting training, we're getting some equipment and things. But I'm going to push those corporates because I look out the window and I see all those high rise buildings and I know that they've got 1,600 staff, 2,000 staff, or well, they're making money out of this region. So I'm going to push them. And then I thought of the small business. I don't call it small business because people don't like calling them small businesses. But businesses of under 10 people, and that's the brochure that you pay, pay you've got. I need your help. I need you to pass that to small businesses you know of. My partner was the first on the list. He didn't have a chance. He was the one I tried it out on. And the truck and trailer company that we buy the Mercedes um, uh, ambulances from were in the office one day meeting me, and I, they got they are second on the list because they have ten staff members in Wellington. And I said, I'm just about to launch this new program, so they've joined up, and have as have many others. But you'll see what I'm suggesting is two hundred dollars a year. If we got a thousand small business giving two hundred dollars a year, it would be an ambulance from small businesses in Wellington. I would like to challenge the corporates to give the same. So I'm trying to push the corporates into giving us an ambulance a year alongside the small business. So thank you very much for listening. I, as you gather, I'm intrigued by the role. I've been there just over three months. I'm going to have to stop saying I'm new, but I still learn every, things every day. I've been... Oh, I forgot to tell you, to, to thank you. you. You, I know, have been involved in the cardiac... the. Um, CPR treatment and uh, many of you know Andrew Dunning and uh, have played tennis, jumbo tennis with him and things like that because of his fundraising. I was given CPR training at Wellington Girls the week I arrived. I thought I'd better get in and do this quickly. And three weeks ago I was on the ambulance and we were racing through the city to get to a cardiac arrest and when we arrived there one of the he had, the, the person had actually died in in his car. We dragged him out and put him on the road and started CPR. Um, and one of the uh, paramedics said to me, sort of casually, although nothing was casual at the time, as you can imagine, "Have you done the CPR training?" And I said, "Yes, I have." And well, get down here then. So within uh, you know a very short time, I'm I'm performing CPR while they put uh, try to put a vein thing in a vein and something down the man's throat to keep him alive. So it was pretty incredible for me to have that happen. Um, and of course it got around the uh, paramedics very quickly that the chief executive, who doesn't know anything of course, because I'm not a paramedic, has uh, been doing CPR. So I wrote my blog to them that they were more interested in those three minutes than anything else I've done since I've been there. But, um, so I just want to say thank you very much for supporting us Please pass this idea on to any small business you can think of. It's an easy way to, for us to um, connect with the small businesses of Wellington. And uh, we are going to send um, a sticker for people's windows if they're a shop or a, or a truck or a um, plumber or whatever, or a logo for their website if it's a website based. So we're really keen to have as many supporters as possible. So thank you very much. He lived for about two weeks. He died last week. And what was really nice was the paramedic kept sending me emails to say that he had been transferred to Hutt Hospital. And, um, but he, he certainly lived uh, then. I mean, it was amazing for me. Yeah. Um, no, I think not for two reasons. One is that we get 15 million from government who fund 
not, I mean, what I think is really interesting, I'm fascinated by this. Sorry to change, to change it a little bit, but um, government will negotiate with a private company to open a prison in Auckland, a private prison. Do you think they fund them to 80% of the cost? No. I'd say 110, 120 or something. But when they, because the services, the uh, ambulance service has been here all this time, we get uh, about 75, 65 to 75% of funding from government. So the first one is that we do get a wadge of money from government and we can provide the service. The other one is that if we really got into trouble, and I have, we ha I have no intention of getting us into trouble, but if we really did, the people of Wellington would step up. I have no doubt about that. So that would be us putting our hand up and saying, you know, we're, we're desperate. We're not desperate because you're going to help us. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's no different than if you do it as a citizen. I'm saying you can, anybody can donate any time they like, but there was no approach to business, to businesses I'm talking about rather than citizens. So many citizens, and we are very lucky, citizens give us money for am an ambulance cost, as it says there, 258000 a year, and about 180000 of that is the truck, uh, and the rest of it is kit. The kit's very expensive, but, um, but individuals have been, and some businesses have, of course. But I'm what sure I meant is there's no, there's, no, <laughs> there's no particular approach to business. And, it do, and you, do, of course, get your tax back, so we're trying to encourage people to do it. But there, there was no approach to business. If we were a um, Nissan car company and they were Toyota, I would be able to say publicly they're, a bunch, they're, they're rust buckets. But because they are a charitable trusts that do bloody good work, uh, it's very difficult. They are in the Wellington region doing first aid courses and they compete for the events. They do not do the ambulance service in this area, we do. The new chief executive of uh, St John is working with us, but it, lots of people in, in, Wellington re in the Wellington region have belonged to St John since they were small children, and so it's very, it is a very difficult issue. We have decided that w what we can do, with your help, is raise the profile of Wellington Free. That's what we have to do. The thing about the paramedics that surprised me is how non-judgmental they are, how they get on with their job, and they treat the people in front of them extremely well. And m many people I know when I'm talking over dinner or with friends of, you know, um, would wouldn't have that kind of patience. They'd be wanting to tell, <laughs> tell the patients something about their lives. <laughs> At certain patients. But our team are amazingly, and they're very professionally trained and very good. One thing I didn't understand, if you're now interested in what, how it works, um, is that the ambulances keep moving all the time. And we have our stations at the hospital, which, by the way, we had to buy and pay for. Um, people think, oh, it's in the hospital. It was probably given to us, but it wasn't. So the, the hospital, uh, Thorndon, Johnsonville, Purirua, Paraparumu, um, Hutt, uh, Upper Hutt, Greytown and Masterton, and then there's little uh, places where we can park an ambulance through the day with a fire service or whatever, and what happens is if, if the ambulance has to move from, say, Johnsonville, there'll be two stations at Johnsonville starting at 6 in the morning, if, or 7 in the morning, if they have to move to go to a job, another ambulance will be sent to, to make sure there's always one hovering in the Johnsonville or in that area. And it happens all that they're moving all the time. And so for the paramedics, they are driving a lot. And they're halfway to Paraparumu, and all of a sudden they're diverted to pick up somebody or do something. And that, they started their light, their day in hut, and they're now um, halfway up the coast. So it, they're moving all the time. And, of course, for us, it's a, a very good um, uh, way of d dealing with potential earthquakes. People say, what about, you know, will you survive in an earthquake? Well, the, good, the best thing for us is that we are moving the ambulances all the time. So the chances of us being hit in any one area are very low um, because we don't have a lot of ambulances in one place at one time. 
The, uh, the ideal would be building the fleet. We, the, the, the staff constantly tell me we need a few more, but we're, st we're building... So maybe that's an answer to the question from the gentleman up here. But, may, but um, it's, uh, an ambulance lasts about three and a half years, the chassis. The kit lasts a bit longer, so we look for about six new ambulances a year and four kit. We're just moving to a different kind of truck. I'm not a petrol head, but you'd think I was the way. It's really funny. I use all the wrong words. But we're moving to a, a different kind of... They're, they're Mercedes. And, of course, the Mercedes company, I think they should be giving them to us for free because they get through the computer when, they, when we go to get maintenance, they get all the, all the information. And Wellington is a fantastic place to try out a truck in an ambulance service because you stop starting and you're going all over the place and, and at speed and not at speed and whatever. Um, so the new truck will be that we can take the back off and put it on the next one. And they tried that a few years ago and it was too wobbly. Wobbly is probably not a right word either, but wobbly, you know what I mean, wobbly. And so, um, so they are... Uh, the, the new one will, will mean that it won't cost us quite as much because we'll be able to save the kit and put it on the next ambulance. The pre-assessment vehicles are only used at the moment in the Kapiti trial. We haven't extended that yet. Uh, and they are, the, um, Mitsubishi work with us on that and they give us a very good, we have a very good relationship with Mitsubishi and we thank them. There's one of the corporates um, who, who, who sponsor us, so we have several of those. But um, that, that's likely to happen. We're likely to see more of that kind of a process. Wellington will always be too small to be too separated. I, I went to the New South Wales um, uh, ambulance and I talked to a guy who ran the London ambulance and they can have special uh, trucks for falls. For, as we get older, uh, falls are a big problem because you, you want someone who is qualified to pick you up off the floor, but you're not necessarily in danger. And you could actually stay on the floor for another hour or two if there was an emergency somewhere else. So well, they have uh, fall trucks um, that can get that, that don't have all the, the same sort of equipment on it as you might if you're going to an emergency like a car accident. So we probably will never get to that. Uh, we have to, in, in lo as in lots of things in New Zealand, we have to be uh, good at everything. Yes, this is where we are together with St John. Um, how's this for madness? Complete and utter madness. But it is changing and the government's seeing this. But if we go to an accident, um, we get funded by ACC. Medical ones, the DHB uh, fund us and uh, ACC fund us for accidents. If we get there and we can treat the person on site and they don't have to go to A&E, and they can go home or somebody arrives and takes it. We look after them. There's no, we don't just leave them there, but we look after them. But they don't go to A&E. We don't get paid. So in my interview for the job, I said, I'm going to pick people up in the street and take them to the hospital if that's what we have to do. You know, I mean, a and is going to be chocker <laughs> until we ch unless they change that rule, that stupid rule. So they're working on it. It is the same problem.